So, DuckTales had its series finale two weeks ago, and it was amazing, okay? Like, wow, I mean, I said before that DuckTales is basically a perfect show, and like, I think I can officially say it is now. Sure, some episodes aren't my favorites, but I don't think that there's one episode that's truly bad. If there is, leave it below in the comments. Anyways, yeah, this show is a wonderful masterpiece, and the story of the final episode, The Last Adventure, was absolutely genius. But, to talk about what makes it genius, we first have to look at the series as a whole, and how the finale fits as the keystone piece. Much has been said by the creators of DuckTales, Frank Angones and Matt Youngberg, about how much effort and planning went into the series to ensure they got every little detail right. This goes from character ticks, to how they all interact with each other, as seen on this awesome character board, to the villains they wanted for each season and how to introduce them. But perhaps the most important detail they planned out beforehand was the larger backstory of each character and how they got exactly where they were in the pilot episode. Questions you might ask like, why did Scrooge decide to trust Bradford of all people to manage his money? What happened to the triplets' as mom? Why is Beakley Scrooge's housekeeper? What happened to Webby's parents? Why is there such tension between Scrooge and Donald? All of these questions have answers, as is true for each and every character introduced into the DuckTales universe. And this is so important, because even if they never got a season two or a season three, they had the plans, the general ideas for the reveals. And that's what makes the writing of the finale so brilliant. They finally got to pay off all of their setups and lore that they have worked on since the beginning. But good writing is only one part of a great finale. What makes this finale work so great is how it works as the keystone to the focus of the series. I talked about this in my last DuckTales video, but each season gives a specific triplet the focus to give them a full story arc and the ability for the writers to stretch and push them. In the first season, this involved Dewey, who began to put together the pieces of the history of his mom alongside Webby. But ultimately, Dewey was the focus of the emotional climax of the season. Then, in Season 2, Louie got the focus, constantly attempting schemes to get rich often at the expense of others, only for him to become the richest duck in the world and truly learn about what wealth means. Then, in Season 3, Huey got the turn of focus, as we learn what it truly means to be a junior woodchuck to him. As the missing mysteries of Isabella Finch's journal are uncovered, his friendship with Fenton pushes him to his limits, and ultimately, in this final chapter, we get the conclusion to Huey's arc. The episode directly ties him to the villain of the season, Bradford Buzzard, who is Isabella Finch's grandson and a junior woodchuck himself. It's here that we see Huey pushed to his limit as he evaluates whether or not Bradford is truly evil in his pursuit of the artifacts, and it's a really nice moment to see not only his choice of his family over Bradford, as his beliefs about woodchucks are questioned, but also his brothers finally accepting that being a junior woodchuck is actually helpful, as it allows them to find him later in the story. I'm the most responsible brother! <laughs> They know I'm here, right? While this would be a great finale if it just concluded Huey's arc, though, it doesn't. In fact, Huey is hardly the focus in this story at all. He's given a more prominent role than the other triplets in the main conflict, sure, but this episode isn't about him. It's about the fourth of the kids, Webigail Vanderquack. Webby was never really going to be able to get her own season, but she has been a crucial part of the show from day one. Her characterization as kid with incredible strength and fighting skills but no social skills provided a unique dynamic with the boys, and her obsession with the history of the McDuck family allowed her to pair quite well with Dewey in the first season in their quest to learn more about the Spear of Selene. If we can find the Spear, maybe we'll find out what happened to her and uncover Scrooge's greatest mystery! To the Naos! That's Greek for Temple. Okay, stop assuming I know things. Like baseline, assume I know nothing. From Louie teaching her about lying and truth, to Huey striving to include her, she has always been an essential part of the story. And not only the story, she gets equal billing as Scrooge and the boys in the marketing of the show. Webby has grown over the course of the show, meeting friends like Lena and Violet, learning about how people work, what friendship is, and really coming out of her shell in so many different ways. But she's never had an adventure truly about her in relation to the McDuck family. She's always learning, striving to be a part, and sometimes sidelined, but not in this finale. Here, she's front and center, and this is her story. I mean, look at the title card. It's really genius to start this episode with Webby's birthday party, because this episode really is a celebration of her place in the family, and gives her a rather compelling character arc. It all starts when the family finds two clones of Webby, May and June, who were created by Fowl for some unknown reason. 
This mystery drives the conflict of the episode as Webby questions if Beakley is telling her the truth, and all the rest of the characters are just as confused as we are watching. And the thing is, when you know the grand reveal of the episode, there's no way to figure it out. There's not a single way these characters could have guessed why Fowl made Webby clones. And here's what's genius about this. This episode wouldn't work if that foundation I discussed earlier hadn't been set. Bradford working for Scrooge, being head of Fowl, all of that was motivated in his pursuit of the Papyrus of Binding. For a time, being in charge of Scrooge's finances, as well as Fowl, was enough despite his clone project having failed. But now, at the end of season two, his plan to make a deal with Scrooge needed to be enacted. Chaos had been allowed to reign for too long. Like Bradford said in the finale, he's worked for 30 years on this contract, all tied to the Papyrus of Binding, and his desire to make a descendant of Scrooge came from the need to get the Papyrus back. So Webby only exists because of the need to get the Papyrus, which means the first adventure had to be at least outlined all the way back when they made the pilot. Bonzo's Bonzo, with all this in the zone! Can I get a grilled cheese, please? Can I get a fettuccine Alfredo? I'll have the duck. Just thinking about all this lore that they set up is insane, and the fact that it all gets to pay off so perfectly in this episode is simply wonderful. But back to the thing that makes this finale truly genius, centering the story around Webby. It highlights how much she's grown from the first moment that calls back to their first visit at Funzo's. Could I get a large cup for water? <gasps> That's not water. Learned from the best. To her display of complete trust in what her family tells her rather than what is easy or what she wants to believe. The clones are evil? Oh no, I didn't see that coming. No, they're my sisters and I'm going to help them. Webby, I just saw one of them take the sword of Swanstantine. Well, okay, maybe she has an appreciation for fine blade craft. Webby knows her place in the family but constantly is forced to question it throughout the episode. The story puts her through the paces and never lets up, from the confession scene with Beakley, to the disappointing reveal that she was created to help Bradford defeat Scrooge McDuck, she learns that the purpose and place she was looking for as to why she was created was never what defined her or gave her meaning. It was her family, and never does that ring more true than when she finds out that Scrooge is technically her dad. And that's what makes the finale of DuckTales genius. It tells a story planned from the beginning, a story focused on giving Webby the moment she deserves to shine. It sure makes this moment hit different. Even if gifting an experimental rocket to a mother of three was clearly a terrible idea. This is a family matter. You are not family. See here, McDuck. You will not speak to my granddaughter that way. You will not speak to me that way. Larry, I'm on DuckTales. Okay, before I go on though, more setups and payoffs. The harp, the feather. God, just everything is paid off in this episode. There's so many other great things as well beyond what I've talked about so far. There's this line that goes on to define what we all know about Launchpad. We may be heroes, but you have the heart of one. There's Manny, who was literally King Andre, I mean the headless man horse of the apocalypse. I live again! And then there's the final scene as the family hugs that actually made me tear up. And it's so sweet that Donald decides to adopt May and June with Daisy. Also, also, I'm a huge fan of fun end credits, and in this episode, they perfectly capture everything that I love about the show, and I could probably make a separate video on the credits entirely, but this finale is great. There's so many fun payoffs, such wonderful character building, even down to smaller subplots like Della having to let go of Donald and Magica being the one to ultimately take down Bradford and make him her familiar, fantastic. I think only a few things got lost in the finale. For one, the humor isn't as rapid fire in this episode as in a lot of DuckTales. Steelbeak is treated as a bigger deal here than I feel he deserved to be. The old villains are brought back only to become mindless clones for most of the episode, which feels like a cheap trick, although they would not have been able to fit them in otherwise and characters like Goslin and Lena get sidelined a bit. But overall, I'd say this is about as perfect a series finale as I could ask for. Having a villain as strong and compelling and interesting as Bradford takes this episode up to an 11, where many other conclusions would have fallen flat. Not to mention all the setups and teases from throughout the series finally click into place. But don't kill me, I still think Moonvasion is better. It's equal in quality, but I think Moonvasion has the better jokes so it's still my favorite. Tell me why I'm right or wrong in the comments below. 
But seriously, to Frank and Matt, if you're watching this, thank you for such a wonderful journey with these characters, and to the entire team of writers, boarders, and artists for putting together such a consistently good show that made me care about so many characters and told so many great stories without dumbing anything down in either emotions or comedy. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you back in Dimension 1. Hey guys, so thanks for waiting so long for my review of the DuckTales series finale. I originally planned to have it out about two weeks ago, but a lot of stuff happened and I needed to get the After the Rain video done and Reanimated was pretty much done, so I wanted to get that out. And then April Fools. So I hope you all enjoyed those videos. I really enjoyed making this video about the DuckTales series finale as well. It was just such a perfect combination of everything that makes DuckTales so great and I think it joins the ranks of best series finales of Disney shows like Gravity Falls and Phineas and Ferb and not Star vs. the Forces of Evil. But yeah, I'm excited to see where Amphibia goes. I am caught up on that. The first temple was amazing. Frobo's here. I can't wait for True Colors and hopefully I'll be able to talk about that soon. The next few videos are going to be on Infinity Train. I'll kiss you then. Bye.